Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're at the SOAS Biannual Open House, learning about the deep sea with oceanographer Jeff Drazen. We'll learn about the creatures of the deep and how we study them. All of these animals that are spread out before us here are all animals that were collected in deep water off of Hawaii. So if you were to drive in a boat five or 10 miles offshore and drop down to a couple thousand feet, these are the kinds of animals that you would find. And they include all kinds of strange things like this fang tooth right here. Look at the big teeth in this guy. It's kind of scary looking guy, huh? It's like from Nemo. And they would include things like this cookie cutter shark right here, with these big gruesome teeth. And lots of lots of other animals that we have out before us, and the deep ocean is a, is a very interesting habitat. It seems very remote from where we are. It's very cold. It's very dark, not pitch black, but very dim light for much of it. And uh, there's very little food because without any light, there isn't production of plant material, plankton. And so many of these animals have a very different food web than you might see on a coral reef, for instance. And that's one of the things that we are trying to understand is what is the food web of the open ocean like and how does that make its way back to us as people because we are the top consumers. This is an anglerfish. Have you kids all seen the movie Finding Nemo? Yes. You remember when they go down into the deep water? Yeah. Yeah, and there's that fish with the lights and the big teeth. Well, that's this guy. It's an anglerfish. See how he looks kind of like a floating head? He's all head tiny little body I'm pinching onto his tail and so what he does instead is he's got this little fishing pole on his forehead and you see the little black dot on the top of my thumb you guys can get closer if you want you see that little dot right there okay that lights up that blinks on and off and something like this little light fish we know now this guy eats plankton and a lot of plankton flashes its lights on and off to communicate so this guy comes over thinking he's going to have a meal, and when he gets too close, the anglerfish opens this gigantic mouth with all the teeth in it and swallows him. And this guy can actually, this is very different than shallow, most shallow water animals, this guy can eat prey that are as big as he is. But what, one of the really important things that we're trying to understand is how all of these animals fit into the food web that we tap into when we go fishing. So do you guys like to eat ahi? Do you guys like to eat poke and sashimi? A lot of those animals actually feed on this stuff. So swordfish, they dive regularly to 3,000 feet to feed. Big eye tuna, they'll forage down at anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 feet or more. And so this is the kind of stuff that they feed on. And what we're trying to do in this lab is understand all of those connections. And more and more these days, we are actually uh, harvesting deep sea fish. So there's another fish I want to show you in this tub. This is called a monchong. See how big the eye is? So this is, this is an animal that lives down in deep water. And we are commercially harvesting this fish now uh, as part of the long line uh, fishery here in Hawaiian Islands. And we don't know much about how it fits into the food web. We really don't know what this, what, this, what this animal is eating. So this interesting animal here is called a hatchet fish. Someone called it a hatchet because they thought this looked like a handle and this sharp edge down here looked like the cutting edge of a hatchet. And I never really saw it, but <laughs> the name stuck. One thing that they do, which is quite interesting, is they can camouflage themselves in the deep ocean as so I was talking about earlier, many predators in the deep ocean spend their time looking for the surface, looking for shadows of animals. That's the best way to find animals in this very dimly lit zone. They have a very narrow profile. You see this? So they have a very small shadow. It's a thin stick-like shadow underneath them right here. But in addition, you can see all these white dots. And those see are all those? Photophores? Those are called photophores. Those are the organs that produce light, bioluminescence. And what they can do 
as they are swimming in the water or floating in the water is they can look up with their eyes and detect how much light is coming down from the sun, the last little remnants of sunlight, and they turn those lights on and they match that exactly. The, the interesting part from the food web perspective is this mercury is entering the food web at great depths. It's entering between 600 and 1,000 meters, we think, and that may be because we have a low oxygen zone here in Hawaii, and that may favor the bacteria that take the elemental mercury, the metal form of mercury, and make it available to animals. They change its formation, they methylate it, and then it can enter food webs. And that may be why all of these deep living fishes have lots of mercury in them. And it just makes its way up to the food web to us. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant. Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. In addition to the deep sea being very important to understand because it forms a base of the food web for a lot of our exploited species, mm -hmm. we are exploiting deep sea fishes, and actually at a much greater extent today than we did 30 years ago. A lot of shallow water stocks have been overexploited, and fishermen are turning to deeper and deeper living species for food resources. So Monchong and Opa are deep sea fishes which are very prevalent in fish markets today. And in the nearshore environment here in Hawaii, we also have a fishery for uh, Onaga and Ehu and some very deep living snappers. And that fishery goes down to say uh, 1,200 or 1,300 feet. And these animals here in Hawaii, as most deep sea stocks are worldwide, are being overexploited. As we are discovering, and something that we're studying here in the lab, is that the depth of occurrence of species correlates very well with their pace of life, their metabolic rates, and their growth rates. Deeper living animals grow slowly, and they have very low metabolisms. Shallow living animals, are very fast paced. <laughs> so in these animals that we're looking at um, that are exploited here in Hawaii, one method to conserve these stocks and sustainably fish for them is by closing certain zones to fishing. Uh -huh. And this is a method that's being explored right now by the state and, and by NOAA, the federal government, and, and, and we are working, principally doing the, the, the field effort and trying to understand whether this, this area, these areas that have been set aside as no fishing zones are going to bring back some of these deep water fish stocks. And by bring back, I mean more fish and bigger fish. Okay. And we're starting to see that the answer is yes. And how do you so, investigate that? So we investigate this. Uh, there are no fishing zones. Normally to, to monitor <laughs> population, you go fishing. You catch fish, you find out how many, and you measure them all. We can't do that here, so what we do is we use cameras. They're still baited, so it's kind of like going fishing. You just don't take the fish out of the water. Now behind me here, we have one of the camera systems that we use. And we drop these things into the water. This is a frame. It's got a camera, another camera here. It's got some sensors that measure what depth we drop this instrument to and what the temperature is. And in the center here, there's an electronics housing. I pulled this over to the side so that you can see it. This is our video recorder. And it has a variety of electronics that control everything and record the data um, onto a hard drive. And in this way, we can count the numbers of fishes that we see attracted to the camera. And because there's two cameras, can how big we can are. tell how big they are. Very and we can cool. measure their, their sizes. So, and you're on, you're on camera right oh, now. Oh, there I am. So, uh, now the system, <laughs> the system here is of closed areas. Most fishermen are pretty familiar with these, of course, but, but other people may not be. Uh, we sort of diagrammed this for the, for the kids visiting today. So, uh, uh, we've got these little no fishing zone signs pointing to these boxes. And each of these areas, fishermen, cannot fish in these areas all year round, does not matter the season. Everywhere else, fishing can occur. 
and we study, we drop the cameras into these protected areas, and then we drop them into areas neighboring the protected areas, and we compare the sizes of the fish and the numbers of fish. And what I can tell you is that in some of these protected areas, we are seeing that the fish are bigger. A couple of the areas that have been protected for 10 years now, actually the difference in size we see between protected and not protected quite conveniently corresponds to about 10 years of growth well, for the animals. Well, that's really good news. So this is the... very good news for, for um, the sustainability of the fishery. And we hope that if, if um, these areas, these, these protected areas are actually enforced, and that the fish populations grow inside of here, that they will result in higher catches for the entire Hawaiian island chain, ultimately. Can you explain to me why closing fishing here would help you have more fish outside of that area? Well, without having fishing here, say, off of Kalapapa, the population inside of here is going to grow. Uh -huh. And these animals are going to get larger. And some of them, eventually, because it's going to get crowded in here, they're going to move out of these protected areas. And if they move out of those protected areas, they're going to increase the populations in the neighboring to, to either side. In addition, if you protect a lot of big old females, big old females produce lots and lots of eggs, much more than a young female would. So we can have lots more little juveniles being, they get carried by the currents, the eggs get carried by the currents, and lots of little juveniles could settle all throughout the Hawaiian Islands and help bolster the fishery. So what you just said about older, larger females producing more eggs than younger, smaller females, that's sort of the opposite of people. Right? Absolutely. Because as yeah. I get older, I become less reproductive. But as the fish gets older, it becomes more yep. reproductive. Yeah. With fishes, it's all about body size. The bigger <laughs> they are, the more eggs they can carry. And, and this is not, uh, a fish twice as big doesn't just have twice as many eggs. It probably has four times as many eggs. So this isn't linear. This is the number of eggs goes up really fast the bigger the fish gets. So that's one of the reasons that not fishing below those size limits is really important. Very, too. very important, yeah. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG has been providing quality educational programs and services for over 40 years, serving students, teachers, parents, educators, and experts around the world and here in Hawaii. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. You're watching Voice of the Sea. The deep ocean is, surrounds Hawaii. And it's the biggest ecosystem on the planet and certainly the biggest ecosystem in our waters. It uh, holds most of the biomass on, or a substantial portion of the biomass on the planet. Yet, it being so unexplored, we're still learning about what lives there. Uh -huh. And we find new species all the time. One of the, one of the ways, it's very exciting, even large fishes and things that we don't, didn't think could live here or had never seen before, we still find those today. So this is not the kind of science that just took place 100 years ago when all the big expeditionary um, um, cruises were going on, but it happens now. We have a very simple tool to try to understand the diversity of animals that live in the deep sea around Hawaii. And this is diagrammed in these pictures by these cameras. We have a, this frame with floats in it, and it's got a camera, and it looks down at this anchor. And here's the anchor with a piece of bait tied to it. And we take this whole instrument and we drop it into the ocean. Now let me show you a really simple cartoon. Drops off the ship, sinks to the seafloor, the fish show up because of the bait, and then we take pictures at two minute intervals and we catalog everything oh, that we wow. see. This, this is a new species of octopus that we've photographed from off of Penguin Banks. This is a sleeper shark. Now this is a meter wide. This is about real life size right here. We didn't know these lived in Hawaii. They've been found off Alaska and California. These are hagfish. It turns mm -hmm. out it's the largest species of hagfish in the world right here in Hawaiian waters. This cusk eel has only been found in the North Atlantic before. We're not totally sure what it is. So, 
And this is a sequence of these images every two minutes, and it shows, this is, this is a few miles off the Waianae coast, a thousand meters depth, and these are king crabs. Most people associate king crabs with living in Alaska or um, uh, Canada, and we actually have several different species of king crabs that live right here in Hawaii. I don't know whether they're any good to eat, <laughs> but um, they can be quite abundant as you can see from this video footage. You'll also see in some of these images that fishes are, are poking their head in, uh, trying to get at some of the bait. There's eels and some rat tail fishes. And uh, in a few moments, we'll see a shark poke his head into the field of view. But this is a, a straight, there's a, there's a ratfish right there. But this is a, a fairly straightforward technique that we can use to sample these very understudied habitats and learn about, a lot about what players are, are living here. And it's more effective than trying to fish for them or trying to trawl for them? It's definitely more effective than trawling for them. Trawling is very destructive and it's very difficult to do in the Hawaiian Islands because we live on the side of a volcano. <laughs> and there are rocks and boulder fields and ridges and these are not conducive to trawling. We also trap. So we put down traps and they catch a lot of these animals. So not, we have not only photographs, mm -hmm. but we have specimens. So, so far we have found the first species of snailfish in the Hawaiian Islands. It's a brand new species. It's about this large. And uh, we never knew that the whole family of fishes lived here before, and we do. They live in Hawaii. And then this eel-like fish called an eel pout, we found the first, it's a new species. We haven't caught it yet, but from the photographs it looks very new. And that, again, is a whole family of fishes that is found in other parts of the world and we now know lives here in Hawaii. And uh, there's a species of king crab that we've found. Uh, it's actually the pictures that you just saw. And as far as we can tell, this animal has only been collected off of New Zealand before. Wow. That's based on genetic evidence. So that's a massive expansion in range. It's kind of like the fish that I showed, which as far as we can tell, looks like a species from the North Atlantic. So we're learning a lot. And these are very large animals. These are not small inconspicuous things living in the mud. These are big animals and we are still finding things new. That's very cool. This is a real dead shark. This is called a cookie cutter shark. And the cookie cutter shark has a really cool story. You want me to tell this story? Okay. So the cookie cutter shark, um, we started catching these, scientists started catching these many decades ago. And and trying to understand where they fit in this deep water food web, of course, they opened up their stomachs, they were dead. And they looked inside. And this is a small shark. It doesn't get much bigger than this. And you might think that it would eat little fishes and squids and things like that. But instead of that, inside the stomach, they found cookies. We're not talking chocolate chip cookies. We're talking little cookie-shaped pieces of fish and sometimes whale blubber, little round disks. So what's going on there? Look at this shark's teeth. Can you see those teeth? Now the teeth on the bottom, see those there? Those are the kind of razor sharp teeth you would expect to find in the mouth of a shark. But what about these little prickly like teeth on the top jaw? Those are kind of wimpy, aren't they? You guys wanna feel those right there? Put your finger in there. Now, do they kind of stick to your fingers? If you kind of push down, do they? They're almost like Velcro, aren't they? They're a little dull because I've done this a lot, but. Okay. Now, that gives us a clue as to what's going on. At the same time, fishermen were catching these deep diving predators like swordfish and big eye tuna that I was talking about earlier and they were finding holes in their side. And I'm gonna show you a, an animal that's been attacked by a cookie cutter shark. William, can you? So William's gonna pick up a mako shark, which is not usually attacked by a cookie cutter. Do you see these two holes right there? Those are bite wounds from a cookie cutter shark. That's where the cookie cutter shark attacked. They're different sizes. That means probably two different sharks attacked this guy. Those prickly teeth that you felt, those latch onto the skin, and then those razor sharp teeth right here, they cut back and forth and they scoop out the cookie. How does this 
slow moving shark that I can catch in trawl nets, how does it get close enough to a swordfish to take a bite out of it? A swordfish is a high performance animal. It can swim at perhaps 20 miles per hour during a burst. How does this guy get close enough? In the deep, envir deep sea environment that we're talking about, a couple thousand feet down, it's not pitch black, but it is very, very dim light. And that light, of course, is coming from the sun up above. And there's just a little bit of sunlight coming down. So a predator, like a swordfish, it spends its time looking back towards the surface because that's the only place it's going to see anything. It's hoping that an animal, like this little fish, is going to swim across its field of view. And when it does, this animal will have a shadow. And the swordfish can see the shadows and attack them. The shark, and as it turns out, a lot of deep sea animals have this. We looked at the skin, scientists looked at the skin of the shark, and it's covered with little light organs, little lights that it makes its own light with. So this shark, instead of making a shadow, it can sense it with its eyes how much light, sunlight there is, and then it turns on all the lights on its belly. So what happens to its shadow? It disappears, and the swordfish can't see it anymore. But there's this dark patch right here, and that dark patch doesn't have any lights. And that dark patch is about the same size as the things that swordfish are trying to eat. Little squids, a lot of little squids, and little fishes. So we think that what happens is the swordfish gets tricked. It doesn't see a big shadow of a cookie cutter shark. It sees a little shadow of something it wants to eat. It rushes up from below, and this guy latches onto the side and cuts out the cookie. And if you go to the fish auction and you see some of the large swordfish that have been brought in by these fishermen, they can have as many as 15 cookie cutter shark bites down their sides in various, in various states of healing. They're old scars in, in many cases. Yeah. Well, this was found out. This story that I'm telling you about has been cobbled together by a number of scientists over many decades. Um, by looking at the, at the way animals are formed, you can learn a lot about what they're doing. The one thing, though, that we are missing right now, and this is something that scientists are, are working on, we don't actually see these interactions. They occur in the deep sea, and it's very, very dark. So you turn on the lights so that you can record these kinds of things. And of course, these animals don't act normally, or they disappear. So that's, that's definitely a, a problem. And, and there are, we use camera systems in, in the uh, deep ocean to try to cover, overcome some of those problems. And one of the things that you can see before you leave this room is in the, in the other side, um, we use cameras in the deep sea to, to look at um, uh, deep water fishes that we commercially harvest here in the Hawaiian Islands. So, yeah. Um. Are the um, animals that the cookie cutter shark attacks, do they live after the attack? They do. Um, I can't say always, but we see, we see animals that have been attacked and their scars have healed. So, and sometimes they have fresh scars as well. So they seem to be attacked and bitten frequently throughout their life. Well, at least many times throughout their life. I don't know if I want to say frequently. Yeah. So. But a lot of these animals, guys, again, they, they form the food of the things that we eat. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA.